So uh, I'll, I'll cover some of the uh, main points of how to publish in, in this transactions. Uh, the website's here, but if you just Google for it, you'll, you'll find it. Um, okay, so some of this, because I'm going last, uh, some of this has already been said, but I'm going to say it again anyway, because it's something that's just worth really emphasizing. Um, number one rule is, first of all, check the scope. Uh, this sounds incredibly obvious, but I get uh, several submissions every year which are just simply out of, out of scope. Uh, so make sure that you do check that. Um, so in brief, the, the journal publishes anything to do with, um, well, high quality papers to do with AI or computational intelligence and games. And so it's no good if it's just computational intelligence and AI with, with nothing to do with games. I mean, that, that seems kind of obvious, but we do get papers that have nothing to do with games and they just get immediately rejected. Uh, so if you go to the website, you find the, the full scope there. Um, it really includes uh, any type of game. Uh, the main paper subject categories that we get are games as an application of CI and AI research. And this includes uh, new and emerging uh, game types. Um, so sometimes the, the research is used to actually invent new games. And there's a sort of fascinating uh, line of research there. Uh, we do uh, the AI and CI to control the in-game characters. That's uh, very interesting stuff. And we also do things like procedural content generation. Uh, so one of the big bottlenecks in the production of games is authoring the content. Uh, so this includes things like the uh, levels of the first person shooter. And you can use uh, evolutionary computation methods and uh, other sort of CI methods to do some of this stuff automatically. So that's also, um, also very interesting. Uh, so there are examples of uh, games as an application of CI and AI research. Uh, an equally important category is using games as a test bed for AI and CI. So, um, if you've got some novel computational intelligence method and you want to see how sort of smart it really is, well, to use a game environment as a test bed, games often be sort of really interesting uh, dynamic environments where you measure the quality of a player against a set of other players, and this is a real sort of uh, test of intelligence that I find particularly interesting. Uh, along these lines we actually run many game competitions and a lot of these are associated uh, with the main conferences in the area, that's the IEEE uh, Computational Intelligence and Games Conference and also the conference on uh, uh, AI and uh, interactive um, uh, digital entertainment, that's the AID conference. Um, so th those are, things are all uh, pretty interesting. So th these conferences have uh, really interesting game competitions associated with them. And we get quite a few papers describing the results of those competitions and also the, um, the main sort of techniques that are used in developing the game controllers for those competitions. Uh, so examples of this include things like uh, uh, AI agents to play real-time strategy games such as uh, StarCraft, which is a really sort of tough game. Uh, this is uh, a huge challenge to the human players, and it's an area where the AI is not even close to competing with the very best human players yet. So that's a major challenge. Um, it also includes non-game applications of game intelligence. Uh, so sometimes people use uh, game theory and game AI to do things like uh, develop a um, cell phone network, uh, this type of thing. These sort of papers are in the minority. So the, the two categories that are put in bold, they account for probably 98% uh, of papers that we get in the, uh, the journal. Uh, now, the, the final one on this slide is games to enhance our understanding of AI and CI. And in fact, um, many of those in the second category actually do that. So by using the AI to uh, develop, uh, but by using games as sort of test bed for the AI, it does definitely enhance our understanding of these uh, algorithms. 
Um, okay, so some uh, basic things. Uh, we have three length categories. Uh, we have uh, the letter, which are three pages. Um, we introduced these a couple of years ago, and I think so far we've only had uh, maybe one letter submitted, and it didn't end up getting published. So that's a kind of underused category. It's quite hard actually to say important things within three pages. Uh, so that's kind of challenging off you to today. Uh, try and get a letter published. Didn't be the first one to get a letter published in this journal. Uh, we've uh, had several short papers uh, published and uh, many more submitted, uh, but most fall in the full paper category. Now, the normal length requirement for a full paper is 12 pages, uh, but you can exceed this where it's justified, so you have to write a cover, cover letter saying why you think it's justified to go over that limit. And um, if the reviewers agree, then it can get published even though it's longer. Uh, we recently had a survey paper published that was 43 pages, so that was uh, well over the limit. Uh, but in the case, uh, the reviewers felt it was uh, justified. That was on Monte Carlo tree search, which is a fantastic interest in the area. It's um, really sort of dominating the area of really tough games such as uh, Go, and um, we, we felt that was uh, justified in that case. Um, okay, I'll just um, put up a slide here showing a range of the the sort of fascinating games that we deal with. It's, it's really all games, uh, but this is just uh, some sort of sample. So on the, uh, on the um, top left here, this is, um, this is uh, Ms. Pacman, and this is done in screen capture mode, so we capture the screen uh, 25 times a second, extract the game objects, and then you send the uh, key commands to control the actual, the actual game. That's uh, provided a lot of interest. And we've had several papers on, on Batman being submitted and um, uh, maybe one or two published. Uh, just in the background here is a classic board game, Othello. And we've had several papers on Othello published so far. Uh, so in many cases, Othello is uh, being used as a test bed for uh, testing out evolutionary algorithms and temporal difference learning, and also interest in sort of hybrids of the two. So it's a real sort of major challenge for machine learning. And in some cases, um, what's also worth keeping in mind, it's often not the aim to develop the, the best possible, uh, the, the strongest gameplay that you can. In some cases, we're using these games as a test pair to say, okay, how can you best design learning algorithms? Uh, now, for Othello, uh, you can have really much stronger players if you use opening databases and endgame databases and really deep tree search. Uh, but that wouldn't necessarily be the most interesting thing for this journal. So we might be far more interested in how these techniques can learn to play the game without being hand programmed to do so. So, you know, think about the scope of the journal and think of what's going to be most interesting. Right. Uh, now we also include uh, obviously 3D games. In the background here, this is a car racing simulator called Torx, and uh, developing controllers for this is, is really kind of interesting. Um, we have a, a special sort of framework that goes over the 3D simulator, and if you go through the, the framework that's used for our competitions, it's specifically made interesting for computational intelligence. So you don't get complete information, you don't get a bird's eye view of the track, Get a sort of first person view based on a kind of sensor model, and uh, this makes it a kind of tougher driving challenge. And working out things like overtaking maneuvers turns out to be really interesting. So there's a whole a bunch of interesting things here. Uh, and then in the bottom right, this is a screenshot from uh, a cognitive neural network that's been developed to play a real tournament. And that's just using a, an example where we're using an existing game at real tournament and because people have gone to an enormous amount of effort to develop these rich complex environments we're able to leverage that and uh, via some interface uh, you can just sort of test out the AI and the CI in these really uh, kind of engaging environments. And we've read several papers in some real tournament and uh, one of our most cited site papers actually is on something called the Bot Prize, where you can develop your AI and CI controllers and actually use these uh, to compete with human players. And the challenge there is to 
to see if human players playing a game could actually tell the difference between these, uh, these software players based on neural networks and so on uh, versus the human players. Uh, so we're able to reuse these games in all kind of, kinds of interesting ways. Um, okay, rule two, read the journal. So this is what um, the, the other editors were saying about know your readership. Uh, and part of that is look at the sort of papers that we publish. Um, so clearly some papers that we get submitted have made uh, no effort whatsoever to relate the research to the research that gets published in the area. And by the area, I mean the journal and the main conferences. So definitely should read those. And obviously cite the appropriate work. So you've got to place your work in the, in the correct kind of context, and you can do that by making appropriate citations to the literature. Um, okay, rule three, and uh, this goes off from what uh, Gary and uh, several of the others were saying, uh, write in English and not some poor approximation. Uh, again, this, this might seem obvious, but uh, some papers are just unintelligible and they just get rejected without being reviewed. Um, others are kind of poorly written, but you know, we understand there are a lot of uh, non-native English speakers out there. Um, but I think you know, even the poorly written ones, they should really be making more effort. It's not fair on the reviewers, and it's not fair on the authors. I mean, they're, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot here, because reviewers often take a dim view and just get upset if things are, are poorly written. Just get an important impression of the work. Uh, so tips here to get it uh, proofread by a native English speaker, or maybe uh, if you're thinking long term, perhaps you can work with uh, co-authors, uh, where maybe one co-author on your team is a really good writer, and they can make the best of your work and ensure that it's really properly, logically, clearly written up. So that, that can also help. Um, okay, so I kind of said three rules. Uh, some of these tips could all also be considered as rules, but I just sort of stopped counting, so these are just uh, tips. Obviously write the best paper you can. Make it interesting and really engage the reader. Sometimes I see papers and I think, this is really worthy work and it should deserve to be published, but they just made it boring. You know, make it interesting, really try to engage the reader. Um, don't make it too long and boring. You have an appropriate level of detail. Uh, you can use supplementary material where possible, uh, where appropriate. Um, really point out why it's important and carefully relate to the previous work. Yeah. Um, obviously, show how it differs from previous work and clearly show what your paper adds. Uh, when you do experimental studies, and uh, I would say most of our papers have some sort of experiment experimental component to them. Um, describe the settings as far as possible so that they can be replicated. Uh, it's not always possible to do this. So some games are so complex and may be written by the authors themselves, uh, they may be commercially sensitive that you can't make them available. We still want to get papers on those. Um, so sometimes it's not possible to actually have them fully replicable. But you should do your best effort. Uh, include images and, vid and videos where appropriate. So games are wonderful, dynamic things. Uh, maybe you've developed a new AI, and you can describe it in the paper, make a really good effort. But by all means, include videos. Uh, you can include supplementary material. And the reviewers, uh, you know, people get lots of stuff to review. And sometimes you just have enough of reading. And if you read in the paper and you can watch a video, well, or you can see some some uh, extra images, it can sometimes convey that information uh, in a nice sort of uh, additional way to the text in the paper. And you should also consider making your software available. So one of the things um, when reviewers read a paper, uh, obviously as a reviewer, you want to read it with a healthy degree of skepticism. Now this is especially true if the results are really astonishingly good. So you might say that uh, you've developed a new um, uh, player for a challenging game like Starcraft or Go, and you've got exceptionally good results, and reviewers are naturally going to be skeptical. Uh, so what can you do to show evidence of that? Uh, well, maybe you can make the software available so they can check it themselves. 
Uh, maybe you can enter competitions. So things like Computer Go, they have regular competitions all the time. And if your algorithm is really good, then you can simply show it's good by entering a relevant competition and say, look, I'm placing it. It doesn't even necessarily have to win all the competitions, but you're, you're saying something about it. And if you're saying how good it is, then you should be able to enter this uh, competition, if there's a competition in the area. Um, obviously, the, you know, this is basic stuff. Uh, statistical significance, choose the appropriate tests, um, make it clear which bits are uh, significantly different and which are not. Um, I, I put this in, but sometimes uh, these things within certain games are quite hard to establish, and uh, you may have used uh, some interesting techniques, generated some novel games, and sometimes it's hard to show statistical significance of the results, but maybe they're still really interesting results. So maybe you can describe it and maybe uh, probably justify it in other ways, but if it's possible, uh, show the stats. Uh, again, in user studies, uh, this just depends on the sort of paper that you're writing, but if you've used uh, AI to develop more engaging characters that are mentally more fun to play against, then probably you should try and show that with a user study and there are a whole sort of um, set of protocols for doing this, so just make sure you, you follow the right ones and have things like a sufficiently large set of users and uh, make sure that they're not biased. Um, survey and review papers, uh, these, are, these are very welcome. Uh, some of the most highly cited papers fall in this category. Uh, just choose an interesting and timely topic. Um, also, I think um, high quality tutorial papers would also be welcome. Uh, I know when I was a PhD student, um, reading some high quality tutorials in the IEEE magazines and, and journals, uh, this was a valuable thing to do. Uh, to our journal, we've not had any submitted yet, but uh, we would uh, encourage really high quality ones on important topics. Um, special issues, and these are the ones that we, we have so far, so that the first set of these have already been published. Um, computational narrative in games, this is still in preparation, but um, this is going to be really uh, this is a wonderful topic, the idea that you can use AI to uh, sort of alter the narrative of the game. Uh, we have an open one at the moment for general game systems with a deadline on the 1st of July. Uh, general game playing is all about the idea that rather than developing AI or CI to play a specific game, uh, you're aiming for general purpose intelligence where at the point of writing the software or programming the agent, you don't even know what games it's going to be given. But there's a protocol there uh, where the agent's going to play a game and get rewarded if it wins and so on. It's, it's going to know at the end whether it won or lost, and over time it's going to learn to play better or adapt in some way. That's really fascinating stuff. And uh, then a new and emerging topic is game data mining. So the games industry is really into this. Uh, so they have. Uh, People sort of clocking up uh, millions of hours of playing time, and they're really interested in how best can they mine all that important information. Uh, maybe it'll make the games even better, or maybe exploit users and uh, get even more money out of them. That's particularly relevant actually for these uh, games with uh, you get the sort of uh, in game purchases, and sometimes uh, you get a fine row who just borrows, uh, borrows his mum's iPad for a bit and installs a game, and it, 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 in the first 15 minutes, after buying a game, you can actually clock up lots of um, lots of purchases, and uh, so sometimes kids have run up uh, like uh, eighty dollars worth of uh, in-game purchases within twenty minutes, and uh, not particularly popular with their parents. <laughs> so, so sometimes the game companies uh, they, they try to exploit this and uh, might have to do this most effectively. Uh, okay, some some statistics. Um, I should mention, by the way, um, in the Sidemago ratings, which are one of the most important uh, journal ratings, we're currently rated uh, 22 out of uh, 114 AI journals. Uh, last year we were 32 out of 109, so we're clearly on a very much an upward trend, which I think is, is really good. Uh, some of the, uh, this is the statistics as of last month. Uh, a couple of things to draw attention to here. Um, the average time of first decision in 50 days is really competitive. Uh, now, you can, you can sort of get on the, the 
best side of that 50 days on the, on the lower side by making the paper really interesting to read and really well written. So I find that typically the ones that take longer, some, I mean, this is of course an average, and some papers might take 100 days to the first decision. Very often those papers are papers with some problems. And reviewers have taken a, taken a longer time to reach an opinion on them. And uh, we might have reviewers who are conflicted, and uh, sometimes it's because the paper is just not that well written. Uh, the other end, um, sometimes we get papers that are so badly written that they get rejected in a day. So that's the other thing that pulls our average right back down. Uh, acceptance ratio, this is around 32%. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, probably about that. Um, one thing that we actively encourage is to extend conference papers. So we have a couple of, uh, I mentioned SIG and A, these are really good conferences, and we get um, a good number of papers published each year at those conferences. Uh, for SIG, the the length of it is eight pages in two column IEEE format. And so in many cases, these are really good initial pieces of work, and they have obvious ways that they can be extended in a full journal paper. So I really encourage authors in those papers to take advantage of this and say, okay, but also you, know, you go to the conference, you present your work, and you get a lot of valuable feedback, and you say, yeah, okay, that's some really good ideas I've got there, so I know what to do now, I'll make a significant extension and write it up as a journal paper. Uh, however, there are several musts here. The extension must be significant. Um, you must provide a cover letter explaining what the significant extension is. And that should also be explained in the paper. And the conference paper or papers that it's based on that must be freely accessible to the reviewers. Okay, so that they can read them independently and say, yeah, okay, uh, this is a significant extension or maybe it's not. Uh, okay, reviews and revisions. Sometimes authors just really make work for themselves. So you submit a paper, uh, nearly always it comes back uh, with some reviews which might say reject or might say revise. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a paper that's just been accepted. They nearly always come back with revisions. Now as authors, what you do next is hugely important. Um, so you can sort of um, see this as a kind of adversarial game where the reviewers ask you to do things and you say, well, I don't really want to do that because it's going to be more work for me. So I'm just going to pay lip service to those points and kind of argue that I've done it. Uh, but the reviewers, well, they're, they're not stupid and uh, they might just reject it at that point or they might send it back for more revisions and it just takes longer and it's just more tedious. So the best thing you can do is to really embrace those comments and see the reviewers as your friends who are trying to improve your paper and just take them on board and say, yeah, okay, I can do that. Now, not all the comments are going to be reasonable. Sometimes they can ask for things which are just, just simply uh, beyond uh, what you could reasonably do. And so you don't have to um, make revisions in response to every comment, but you should respond in detail to every comment and provide a cover letter explaining exactly what you did and where you chose not to uh, make a revision, you just explain why. Yeah. So see there's a cooperative game rather than an adversarial one. Um, okay, that's it, so I'll stop there. Thank you.